It experiences constant volcanic eruptions, it has the world's northernmost capital city, and you can experience days when the sun never sets, or never rises. Today we're talking about Iceland. Iceland is a country located in the North Atlantic Ocean. Despite its isolated location, Iceland is normally considered part of Europe for its historical and cultural connections with Scandinavia. The main island of Iceland, which makes up most of the country, is 101,826 square kilometers in size, which makes it Europe's second largest island after the island of Britain, which is actually more than twice as large. As an island nation, Iceland does not have any land borders with other countries, but it shares maritime borders, as well as close cultural and historical ties with Greenland and the Faroe Islands, both of which are autonomous countries within the Kingdom of Denmark. Iceland is a sparsely populated country, with a population of only around 380,000 people, the vast majority of whom descend from settlers from Scandinavia. While there may have been some Irish monastic communities on the island prior to the Vikings, Iceland's recorded history begins during the Viking Age, which lasted from the year 793 to 1066. In the year 870, the first circumnavigation of Iceland took place, meaning people sailed around it. And in the year 874, permanent Norse settlement began, with Ingolfur Arnarson being the first settler. At least he's traditionally thought to be the first. What was the island of Iceland like when the first Norse settlers arrived? Well, despite its isolation and desolation, to the original Scandinavian settlers it must have seemed pretty familiar to their original homes, at least in certain ways. Iceland's coastline features many fjords with fine harbors. The climate, while cold, is moderated, especially along the coast, by the influence of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf Stream, as is the case on the Scandinavian Peninsula. Iceland was also fairly densely forested when the original settlers arrived, with about 30% of the island covered in trees. Unfortunately, thin soils made the island vulnerable to deforestation, and now the island is mostly treeless. But at the time, it was forested like the Scandinavian Peninsula. But some of the inland parts of the island look nothing like anywhere else on the planet. The interior of Iceland is covered in volcanoes, around 130 of them, and there's a major eruption every five years on average. The landscape is covered with recently cool lava fields, as well as geothermal hot springs. About 10 to 15 percent of the country is covered in glaciers. Iceland's stunning landscape is the result of its geography. The island sits along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which separates the North American plate from the European plate. Underneath Iceland is a hot spot, a place in the Earth's crust where magma from the mantle breaks through to the surface. This hot spot is responsible for Iceland's volcanic activity, which is responsible for the formation of Iceland itself. As you can imagine, life was not easy for the early Viking arrivals, but they persevered and governed themselves for over 300 years. The assembly of Iceland, the Althing, or Althingi, was founded in the year 930. It's sometimes said to be the longest lasting parliament in the world. But the fact that it was abolished in the year 1800 and wasn't re-established for 44 years kind of puts a dent in that claim. A period of civil strife began in Iceland in the mid-13th century, and in the year 1262, Iceland's chieftains asked for Norwegian protection under an agreement called the Old Covenant. This began a long period of foreign rule over the island. As a result, Iceland became a constituent part of the Kingdom of Norway, and as a part of Norway, it later became part of the Kingdom of Denmark-Norway at first as part of the Kalmar Union, which included Sweden. After the Napoleonic Wars, Denmark lost Norway to Sweden, but it retained Iceland under Danish rule. During the 19th century, Icelandic nationalists began demanding autonomy from Denmark. This was granted over the course of the late 19th century. In 1918, Iceland was granted sovereignty, meaning Iceland became an independent country, but it still had some ceremonial ties to Denmark, including the Danish monarch as its head of state. After Denmark was occupied by Nazi Germany in 1940, British and American troops occupied Iceland to keep it from falling into German hands. Iceland's leaders were opposed to this because it violated their intention to remain neutral. Well, at least that's what they said publicly. Privately, they might have been quite happy about the extra security, not to mention that the British and American presence gave Iceland a huge economic boost, turning it from a poor country into a wealthy one. But despite the benefits of the foreign presence, Iceland wanted to be independent, and in 1944, Iceland overwhelmingly voted to become a republic, independent of Denmark and any other country. Even so, since the end of the war, Iceland has pursued cooperation with the US as well as Europe, joining the European Economic Area in 1994. Iceland is made up of eight political regions, but geographically it can be divided somewhat differently into a number of regions. 
I know that some people will say these regions are wrong, but this is just one way of dividing the country up geographically. Southwest Iceland is dominated by the capital city Reykjavik and its surroundings. Around two-thirds of Iceland's 380,000 people live in this region. Reykjavik is a lively city for its size, with many festivals and events. Because it's the world's northernmost capital city, and fairly close to the Arctic Circle, like all of Iceland, it experiences the midnight sun in summer, when the sun is at least partially visible 24 hours a day. Imagine going out for a beer late at night in this scene, which feels more like early in the morning. Oh, and now that I'm on the topic of beer, did you know that beer was banned in Iceland until March 1st, 1989? Well, beer with more than 2.25% alcohol, that is. Now March 1st is known as Beer Day to celebrate the repeal of that strange restriction. Sorry, back to the regions of Iceland. One special place in southwest Iceland is the Blue Lagoon, a large outdoor geothermal spa, one of the most popular places to visit in the country. A significant portion of Iceland is covered by glaciers, and that includes those in western Iceland, such as Snæfellsjökull, a glacier-capped volcano in the national park of the same name. Further up the coast, the West Fjords are the part of Iceland most exposed to the harsh winds of the Atlantic. Here the landscape is rugged and very dramatic with glaciers, mountains, and long fjords. The West Fjords region contains some of the most remote parts of Iceland, and there are only 7,000 people living in the entire region. Another remote region, and one that's difficult to navigate, is the interior region. The largest glaciers in Iceland are found in this region, or partly in this region. Glacial rivers that stem from these glaciers flow towards northern Iceland. Because of this, there are a number of dramatic waterfalls there, such as the appropriately named Godafoss, meaning Waterfall of the Gods. The largest settlement in northern Iceland, and also anywhere in Iceland outside of Reykjavik, is Akureyri. Despite being near the Arctic Circle, it has a relatively mild climate, and its fjord and harbor are ice-free year-round. This is one of the reasons it's a relatively large settlement. And by that I mean, well, 20,000 people. Hence the phrase, relatively large, for Iceland. Southern Iceland lacks the fjords that characterize the rest of the country. Many important sites can be found in southern Iceland, especially Thinkvetlir National Park, about 40 kilometers east of Reykjavik. Not only is this the site of the original Althing, it also sits right in the rift valley of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, in other words, right where the North American and Eurasian plates meet. Iceland is the only place in the world where the Mid-Atlantic Range is above sea level. East Iceland is home to the East Fjords, a 120-kilometer stretch of coastline punctuated by fjords surrounded by magnificent jagged cliffs. It's also home to the Hinkifoss Waterfall, one of the highest waterfalls in Iceland, with a drop of 128.5 meters. The highest glacier in Iceland is Morsárfoss, located in Vatnajökull National Park, where Vatnajökull, the largest glacier in Iceland, is found. This glacier only just appeared in recent years, when an outlet glacier of the Vatnajökull glacier began to melt. Iceland's stunning otherworldly landscapes mean that tourism has become one of the most important parts of its economy especially in the years following the devastating financial crisis of 2008, with over a million visitors a year, almost three times the resident population. This definitely helped Iceland's economic recovery, though it also turned out to be a vulnerability during the COVID-19 restrictions that cut off tourism completely, but hopefully that's all behind us. Fishing also continues to be one of Iceland's major industries, which employs 5% of the workforce directly and up to another 15% indirectly. The importance of tourism, as well as their relative proximity to the UK, means that Icelanders are generally very proficient in English. Many sources claim that 98% of Icelanders can speak English. But of course, the official language of Iceland is Icelandic, quite a conservative language that has changed relatively little over the last 1200 years. To learn more about Icelandic, check out this video I made about it on my other channel, Langfocus. Something related to that linguistic conservatism is that first names in Iceland must be selected from a predetermined list of Icelandic names, or otherwise be approved by the Icelandic Naming Committee. As for surnames, patronymic names are used in Iceland. Instead of a last name, Icelanders have a second name based on one of their parents' names, usually the father's, with the suffix son or dohtir. So if your name is Jón and you had a son, his surname would be Jónsson. And if you had a daughter, her surname would be Jónsdóttir. This was done not only in Iceland, but in Scandinavia as well. But the other countries abandoned this system a long time ago, while Iceland maintains it. Though conservative when it comes to things like language and names, in other ways Icelandic society has been more progressive than most of the world. In 1980, Vigdís Fimpohadóttir became president of Iceland, giving Iceland a female head of state before most countries in the world. 
Around 50% of Iceland's parliament is female, and the country scores at or near the top of most measurements of gender equality. Iceland's parliament legalized registered partnerships in 1996, conferring almost all benefits of marriage on same-sex couples, and it legalized same-sex marriage in 2010 by a unanimous vote. Reykjavik's world-famous Pride Parade is attended by as many as 100,000 people. That's in a country with fewer than 400,000 people. While Icelandic society is not perfect, it has certainly done well despite its isolation and largely remote physical landscape. Iceland scores very high on social well-being indicators. Around 66% of Icelanders are satisfied with their lives, 75% think their lives will get better in the future, and 98% said they knew someone who they could rely on in time of need. Which shows that social isolation is less of a problem there than it is elsewhere, despite the isolation of the country itself. If you're Icelandic, what would you like people around the world to know about your country? And other people, would you like to visit Iceland if you had the chance? If so, what is it about the country that attracts you? Iceland is a Nordic country with cultural and genetic roots in Scandinavia. One Scandinavian country is Sweden. Check out my video on Sweden. I'm absolutely certain you'll learn something new about the most populous Nordic country.